Have you ever forgotten someone's name and made a situation awkward? Maybe after a night of drinking with friends, you accidentally gave the waitress an 80% tip. Maybe you just want to be able to learn faster or get things done in less time. Or maybe you still have that song stuck in your head that you watched on YouTube back in 2005, even though you've long forgotten the name. Hit record and uh, terrific. So now go ahead again. All right, so we'll jump right into it. Jerry, what is something that 50 years from now, closer to 2100, will look back and say, oh, why did we do it that, that way? We'll sigh, facepalm, whatever you want to call it. We'll say this is not the optimal way to do it because we'll know better. What comes to mind? It might take us 50 years to keep realizing this, but there's plenty of people around right now who realize how screwed up the present education system is. Um, uh, it's funny, there's a really common thing that people start speeches about education with, which is if you took a doctor from, you know, a thousand years ago and put them in a medical operating room today, they wouldn't know what to do. They wouldn't know from infection and bacteria. They wouldn't know from electronics. But if you took a, a teacher from a thousand years ago and dropped him in a, a classroom today, they'd be perfectly comfortable because everything would be familiar. And it, it, it's, a, it's a, actually a bogus, completely nonsense comparison because we industrialized the entire school system only a hundred years ago between the US Civil War and the First World War. So anybody from a thousand years ago would have been wandering around under the trees, they would have had the older children teaching the younger children, they would have been distributed in very small units, not a thousand kids to a school. I was part of 997 kids in my graduating class at wow. Marina High School in Huntington Beach, California. So, um, so I, I think we don't realize how screwed up the current structure is. There are plenty of people saying so. So 50 years from now, I'm hoping we will slap our, our, our you know, hands to our, to our faces and, uh, and realize that the entire structure, our, most of our working assumptions about the industrialization of education were just off. Okay, that makes sense. So I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure you and I have realized that now. And that's definitely one of the points that we'll be covering in Meta itself is what what are we stuck on and how can we evolve? For sure. So, so uh, let's just go right down the list here. Um, let's talk about the brain. And you actually have an iPhone app with your face on it. And it's called Jerry's Brain. And it's not your real brain. It's a digital brain. So tell us a little bit about what the brain is and how you use it. Exactly. So it's a piece of software called The Brain. I was on their first press tour. I used to be a tech industry analyst. Uh, and 18 years ago, uh, in fact, uh, in another month or so in December, it'll be 18 years, uh, they came by and they said, we got this app called The Brain. And it's not, it doesn't do any simulation of brain function. It's not trying to emulate neurons. Uh, it has no built-in intelligence. It's really only a concept mapping tool. I think of it as Photoshop for ideas. But when I saw it, um, I'm pretty visual. My dad was a civil engineer who used to draw things for me. And when I saw it, I'm like, holy hell, this is exactly how my brain works. So I started using it then, basically a month before they shipped to the public, and I'm still using this brain uh, today, 18 years later. And the weird thing is, the, not the noteworthy thing is, I'm still using the same data file that I opened 18 years ago. So I don't know anybody who's using uh, the same file that they started that long back, almost two decades, right? So when I add things to my brain, and today I probably added 30 things, there was, I was in a bit of a frenzy uh, adding stuff for, for a variety of reasons yesterday, also about addiction and about other topics today, more about the history of English. I get on sidetracks like that. But what I've learned is that all of us are missing curated context. That we're busy, we're sort of trying to swim through an ever-increasing info flood of information. We're trying to survive the flow and we don't have good tools that let us capture things from the flow and make sense out of them and share that sense making with one another. And I think that that's crippling civilization. Uh, so the brain has allowed me to capture what I care about, put it in context and share it back out with other people. It's not a very good collaboration tool. And I don't think everybody on earth should be using the brain. I don't think that's the answer either. But the one of the many lessons of the brain for me is that we desperately need more tools that let us figure out what we know and share it really productively with each other. That's a good answer. And so in the internet age, without that curated context, we just end up with lots and lots of things. And I'm sure people out there have thousands of likes on YouTube. They have thousands of pins in their Pinterest, whatever it may be. How does that get organized in the brain? 
Yeah, so what, what ends up happening is we become really easy to manipulate by politicians, by corporations, by whoever, because we don't really have a memory. We don't remember what we agreed to. We don't remember what we know. Um, it's all just kind of flowing past with a whole bunch of likes attached to it. At best, you have a blog that goes back a couple years, five, six, seven, ten years if you've been blogging for a long time, but I don't remember what I blogged two years ago. I have to look it up, right? Right. Um, so I think that... Um, having a brain makes us less susceptible to manipulation and more capable of in-depth conversations that actually lead someplace. Um, so one of my realizations is just how shallow our conversations are these days. You look at the, you know, the TV news, a two minute segment is maybe typical. An eight minute segment is, is, oh my God, eight whole minutes on TV, on, on the TV news program. That must be a huge issue. And if you think about it, they have to introduce the issue, they have to say something, show a little B-roll, then they have to get out of it. And at no point are they connecting you to the actual underlying materials. At no point do you get to see all the stuff they cut out. At no point do they link to context. It's insane that we're supposed to be running society or civilization on such primitive, stupid tools. So I, I think we have a long way to go to have better tools for, for not just collaboration, but for reweaving the fabric of civilization. I think this kind of leads us into uh, one of the words that I found on your least favorite words list in your brain, which is consumerism. Mm -hmm. And the news is created like consumerism. Uh, most channels on Twitter, Facebook, it's just like, read, oh, if the longer we can keep somebody watching, the more money we get. So wh what do you think about consumerism and why is it negative to society? Yeah. My whole journey, the, the, the place I'm at right now, really started uh, around the same time as I started using the brain, so mid-90s. Uh, when I realized I didn't like the word consumer. And it took me a long time to realize that we've consumerized every sector of society. Um, not just consumer goods, but also what used to be called culture is now the entertainment industry. News has become infotainment. Education has been consumerized as well. We sort of, you know, you're trying to buy degrees. Do you want the Harvard degree or the Stanford degree? Or, oops, you didn't get into those. How about the UCLA degree or something else? Um, and our only job as good consumers is to choose between the Cheerios and the Cocoa Puffs. Your job is not to be curious and invent Cheerios. You're not, your job is not to ask how the Cheerios were made or to make your own Cheerios. Um, you just, and if you stop buying more Cheerios, the entire economic system will fall apart. So th those are basically the premises that we're working with right now in consumer society, which destroyed and pushed aside old ways of being together in society. So I don't, I don't want to roll the clock back and say, let's all go back to feudal times or prehistoric times. I'm trying to figure out how do we marry the best of the old, ancient wisdom where we, we sort of weren't just consumers, we were citizens in society with interdependences, um, managing our commons and living together. And I think we were actually very wise in many places on earth a long time ago. How do we marry the best of the old with the best of the new, which is I have a device sitting here this little slab of, of unobtainium and silicon and whatever that lets me communicate at zero marginal cost with almost you know half the people on earth. How do we marry all that together into some new way of being together that's good for the planet, good for us, and isn't all about consumption? Because consumption is part of the linear economy. It's part of the take, make, waste economy uh, that's kind of killing all of us. Good answer. So could okay, you connect got this more, got a lot more to... I can say about that too. Could you connect this to the paradigm shift uh, for self-awareness and being able to think more about the self and what works for you rather than what works for the masses? Uh, that's a tricky question because um, one of the problems with consumerism is that it came along with individualism. And there's very much the cult of the individual. And in sort of traditional neoclassical economics, if only each individual were acting in their own greedy self-interest, Trust us, the whole thing works out on the whole. Um, and there's just ge this general mistrust of the masses. So we think of the masses as mobs, as unruly things that run out of control. What we've lost is interdependence. We've lost the fabric of society. We've lost all the things that used to keep us bound together in society. And as Maggie Thatcher so famously said, there is no such thing as society. And I think she was just full of it. Um, that society is what we're all about, we want to connect. We, in fact, need to be connected. And consumerism snips away all those moments of connection because you can just buy your way to happiness by buying products and services and by creating your identity around the brands you put on yourself. 
all of those things. You can sort of hear from the way I'm describing it um, how insidious they are. So I think that it's not about distancing ourselves from the masses or, or knowing ourselves better as individuals. It's kind of about being an individual within society and understanding what you bring and that there's strength and diversity and making it all work together so that together we use everybody's best features so that together we maintain the earth better so that together we sort of create profitable enterprises that work really well. Um, it's kind of amazing because many things are broken when you start seeing this, um, which means many things need reinvention. So uh, part of what needs reinvention is what do we mean by the individual in society? That's, that's definitely something to think about. Kind of reminds me of uh, the book Reality is Broken by Jane McGonigal. And in the book she's saying uh, if kids are glued to their phones, they're getting absolute entertainment. They can't take their eyes off of them. They're basically addicted to them. And they can't spare a bit of attention for the teacher. We need to just put the education in here. We just need yeah. to shift it over. Yep. Um, and it's, it's funny, just this is a side note, but... Um, we're addicted to these technologies for several really good reasons. One of them is we're living in the middle of consumer society where every other avenue for connecting and linking up has been shredded. And so these games are pretty attractive compared to kind of the, the, the barren society we've been given. It's like, well, go see a movie or go play Nintendo is, is kind of the answer. Um, but another one is these little slabs of unobtainium um, are a miracle. Like, Never before could you leave something in cyberspace. I, you know, we're recording a video right now. We can, we can publish this out on YouTube or wherever, and it will be there for other people to pick up. I can see comments. I can see threads um, of the people around the world who have created and added to ideas. Um, I can play games with people who are situated anywhere on the globe at this very moment, and we can you know, yell at each other and, and go do a guild raid or whatever else it is, or we can build something in Minecraft. That's really incredible. And, and I think we underappreciate just how fantastic this thing is, how new it is. I'm thinking here of Louis C.K.'s, you know, everything's wonderful, everybody's angry uh, video. Um, so I think the addiction, in fact, is temporary because anybody born today will take for granted all the stuff I just said and be like, well, what do you mean I can't contact anybody or look up anything? That's just, you know, I was born into that. Now what? Um, so... Our generations are the ones who will show these signs of addictions and, uh, you know, there's kids in Korean PC bongs who are falling over dead because they played too much um, uh, you know, of some online game. That's going to be a symptom of our times, but I think it's, it's temporary, not a sign that all these technologies are terrible for us and we should therefore eradicate them. Okay. That's a solid uh, viewpoint. I'm somewhere in there, too. It's like it's the combination of the good and the bad. And 20 years from now, we'll look back at Psy. It'll just be, we'll have, we'll have seen through it by then. But exactly. let's, let's change the topic a little bit. Tell me about Rex and why you originally founded it and what the mission is. Um, so Rex is the Relationship Economy Expedition. And I, uh, I created it because I'm, I, back in the 90s, I realized I didn't like the word consumer. That, through a, a long and twisty path, led me to this notion that we are entering now uh, we are rediscovering a whole series of relationships that have been broken. Uh, the relationship between people in society, the relationship between companies and people. They've been treating us as mere consumers for all this time, and we're much more than that. The relationship between governments and people, um, the relationship between companies and the earth, all of those are being reinvented. And so what we do in Rex is we explore what all those things are, mean, what those changes mean, and how they might actually be uh, improving the earth, improving society, improving our lives. Cool. So what are you guys working on today? Uh, what's something that in the past like week or two you guys have been focused on? God, so many things. Um, uh, well, we've been, we've been talking about a whole bunch of different things. One thing that, that is central to all of Rex is trust. Um, one of the insights is that all the institutions we take for granted today, most of them, were designed from mistrust of the average individual. That's a bit of a problem. Um, out of that spins a different way of looking at things, which is designed from trust, not for trust, but from trust, which is beginning with a gesture of trust and creating an environment that is based on or fosters trust uh, and seeing where that goes. And Wikipedia here is a very nice example. Um, the edit this page on every page of Wikipedia 
is a gesture of trust. Uh, it's not naive trust because Wikipedians know what vandals can do. Uh, but in fact, what that turns into is this interesting dance where people contribute to Wikipedia and make it what it is. But you see this all over the place in, in open source software, in open space meetings, in open government, uh, you know, outside of open everything movements. It's all over the place as well in traffic calming and animal gentling and uh, democratic workplaces and democratic free schools. I can point to hundreds of different groups around the world that are that are doing this kind of thing and leading us to, um, I think, uh, a much nicer, more connected, more fruitful world. Awesome. Awesome. And that's something we all have to look forward to. I know that the uh, trust thing was covered in your TED Talk and uh, the, just the Wikipedia thing. I always thought of it as, oh, how do we go in and mess up Wikipedia back when I was 10? But now it's like, it's, it's more valuable to me than any book series, anything else that I've had access to because it's all there. And it's, it's up to date. It's Everyone's contributing to it. And it's not 100% accurate, but neither was the Britannica and neither is anybody's encyclopedia. I think part of what's interesting is the debates around what does accuracy mean? What is truth? How do we fact check? How do we, in fact, have these conversations? So when I said earlier that we don't have a memory and that makes us more susceptible to manipulation, one of the very few tools we do have for memory is something like Wikipedia. Uh, and I mean very few. There are a few things like Wikipedia where people are curating context with content. And that's, that's really the goal, to be able to provide those saturated lessons where you get all of the information. It's not watered down. There's no uh, extra BS. It's just all there. Well, it, more or less. I mean, I was just in Wikipedia yesterday looking up family systems theory, and I, I tweeted about this. I said, well, it's weird, but family systems theory is its own sort of... Um, uh, family systems therapy is specifically what I was looking for. It goes back to Alice Miller and... Uh, uh, Oh, God, what's her name? Uh, anyway, an another great thinker whose name is skipping right now. Um, um, oh, shoot, her name just flashed by again. Anyway, it turns out that if you're in Wikipedia, there's family therapy and there's systems therapy and systems thinking, but there isn't this other little sort of crossover category, so a lot of meaning of that particular phrase is lost in Wikipedia. So it's, it's, it's far from perfect. Virginia Satir is the other woman. Um, so it, it's, it's far from perfect, but if I had more time, I could jump in and try to make that argument and try to perfect it, for example. And, you know, couldn't have thought about doing that for Britannica. That's, and that's true. It's, you had to just buy it when it came out every, I don't know, year, 10 years, which means that no matter what, you were behind. Yeah. And, of course, that's, that was an innovation back when it was around because the printing press, we were able to share that much information. But right now, it's exponentially on another level. And that's, that's powerful. Definitely. So, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about uh, before I have to run, I actually have a video shoot after this, um, mental scripts and thought loops and like patterns of thinking. Yep. So what are, what are these and how do they play into everyone's daily lives? So we all run around with a bunch of little scripts in our heads that, that are, are part of our belief system. And we got them from how we were raised and socialized and acculturated. We got them from watching things. We got them from puzzling through how the world works. We got them sometimes just as hand-me-down thoughts. So uh, there are things like scarcity equals value or time is money or good fences make good neighbors or, uh, you know, th there's a bunch of these different kinds of things. And, and some of them you can assemble into political belief systems. Um, you know, libertarians have a particular set of these scripts. Uh, liberals have a different set of these scripts, etc. But we're, we're seldom aware of what our scripts really are. And this is really alarming. We're seldom aware of how flawed most of our scripts are. But the fact is, as we wander through making sense of the world, the scripts are the first things we hold everything up to. And they're, they're the first reason why we throw away evidence that might in fact change our minds, evidence that might in fact influence us for the better. Um, so I, I want to just say we should all be cautious about these scripts that we believe and hold them gently. And... Um, when they are so, sort of seen to, to be flawed, we should drop them. So, um, you know, the notion of good fences make good neighbors mostly comes from uh, Frost's poem, The Mending Wall, where he, said, you know, where, which is, where he talks about good fences make good neighbors. But the whole poem is about questioning fences. It's not about, hey, if I put a fence between you and me, that means we'll be better neighbors. In fact, he's saying, 
wherever where I was about to erect a wall or a fence, I would question why it is there at all, that mostly the fences are what break society. So our conventional wisdom on that is completely upside down. If you go look in my brain, and good fences make good neighbors, um, you'll mm -hmm. find a whole bunch of other sayings like that. So go to jerrysbrain.com online, and you can wander through that and a whole bunch of other sayings that, uh, that are scripts we use that are, are faulty and broken. So, Jerry, could you say that scripts are kind of like intuition, whereas logic is when you're actually analyzing the situation, or a little bit of both? Uh, more or less. It's a, a little bit like Kahneman's uh, System 1 and System 2 thinking in uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, mm -hmm. where, where the scripts are the, the System 1, the, just the instinctive thing mm -hmm. that'll cause you to dismiss something or agree with it right away. Uh, and then logic is our System mm -hmm. 2 thinking. We're not so good at the logical part either. We, we justify a lot of things. We, we eliminate a lot of things from view because we have um, sort of confirmation bias is one of the, the ways we see the world. That Anything that doesn't fit our model of how the world is supposed to work, we will pretty much throw away. Um, so even our very logical part of our lives is less sound than we think it is. But, you know, if we spend more time there and are a little more open to other ways of seeing, I think that makes our logical lives a bit better. So, yeah, you, mm -hmm. could, you could sort of generalize that way, like you said. Cool. Well, this has been a good interview, Jerry. Uh, a little bit briefer than our last conversation, but the little snippets are going to look great in the uh, in the Metapilot. So awesome. um, if you could just send me this via Google Drive, I got to run here and get to, uh, it's actually a rap cipher. And so one of my uh, friends, he was like a guidance counselor in my high school. Um, he's like 40 years old. He just, he always helps kids. And so he decided that so many kids wanted to rap that he was going to help them. And so he's putting on the event. He's paying us to record like five or 10 tracks and do a video about the whole thing. So well, that sounds great. Um, Pretty neat. Excellent. So along the way, I got a little note that um, my computer wasn't strong enough to record at the full recording quality I had set at the start. So watch the whole thing through. I'm hoping that it worked at good quality, but we'll we'll see what happened. Awesome. I mean, if it's it, any quality, as long as the picture is good, the, the what, what you said and what we covered was perfect. For